Luke chapter 9. Last week we, uh, we covered up to verse uh, 48. Last week we uh, observed, uh, among other things, the Apostle Peter. We started, uh, actually I believe it was in verse 18, as Peter was confessing Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ, as the anointed one, as the one prophesied of old, foretold of old, that would come. I would come and save man from their sins. And of course, that all too famous statement that he made when he said, when Christ asked, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered and said, the Christ of God. So we observed that, we covered that last week, and uh, of course, a number of other things, Jesus predicting his death, and resurrection, which they just didn't get. They just, they just couldn't wrap their head around how the deliverer would die, let alone be raised from the dead. Of course, our need for a daily relationship with him. In verses 23 through 25, where Christ said that we need to die to ourselves. We need to take up our cross. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Following Christ requires action in one's life. To say I'm a believer and to say that there is no change in my life, I'm lying to myself. Because God didn't save me or save us to remain as we were. Biblical change is something that must take place in the life of a believer. Now, biblical change doesn't take place to save a soul because then it would be salvation by works, and we recognize that it's only one work, Jesus' work on the cross. So I don't work for my salvation, but as Scripture says, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. It's a spiritual workout. Because I have put my trust and faith in Jesus Christ unto salvation, I work out my salvation with fear and trembling. There is action that takes place in my life, and that action and my purpose and your action and your purpose, ours together corporately, is to glorify the Lord. Amen? To glorify the Lord. The only way that can happen is to die to self. So we discussed these and many other things, and last week, of course, we ended on who's the greatest. Get a bunch of guys together. I don't care if they know the Lord or not. Get a bunch, to, a bunch of guys together, you know. Who's bigger, badder, more, you know, tough? Who can, you know, I don't know, play golf better than the rest? Well, you just get, you know, guys are always in that competition mode. You know, I'm all for being, as a Christian, in competition. But the problem with these guys, great men of God, had a lot to learn, so do we. The problem with these guys is not the fact that there was competition. The problem is that there was competition among them, instead of competition with oneself. You see, we're not here to compete against one another, to one-up one another, to be better than one another, because why would I want to be better? Why would you want to be better, or any of us be better than one? We're, all of us are imperfect. God is doing his work, his work of perfecting us, but we're still under construction, so to speak. You see, we aim too low. We shouldn't be looking to one another. They were looking to one another. Who's greatest? Oh, I'm better, I'm greater, whatever. Not so. We look to God's word, and we see, where does my life match up with the word of God? And this was in verses 46 through 48. And where does my life match up with the word of God? And I see where I need biblical change. I see where I need biblical growth and biblical maturity in my life, not a competition of one another. Unfortunately, even pastors do that as well. I've heard it before. (laughs) <laughs> I have at different uh, kind of conferences and things like that. Well, Hi, my name is so-and-so. My name is so-and-so. How many people go to your church? It's like, like, who cares? Like, seriously, who cares? 
You know, and, and, and again, and I think to myself, hey guys, uh, do you remember Luke chapter 9? You know, remember Luke chapter 9? So this is an issue that we deal with, and I don't care of, of who you are, where you've come from, but we need to crucify the flesh. Going back to verses 23 and 25. But nonetheless, this week we're going to pick up where we left off uh, here in verses 49 and 50. So if you follow along with me, it says, Now John answered and said, Master, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow with us. But Jesus said to him, Do not forbid him, for he who is not against us is on our side. Now, John felt, uh, I believe, <laughs> very territorially threatened. And remember now, this is on the heels of who's the greatest, you know? And here now, there's those that are not even a part of, of this group, okay? And they feel very territorially threatened here. Sometimes we can get like that as people, right? You're like, you're on my turf. You know, this is my ministry right here. You know, and we kind of, you know, dig our shoes into the ground or, you know, this is my area, whatever. But you know what? I don't even say this is my pulpit. It's not, really. I mean, I'm replaceable. God can replace me in a moment if he wants to replace me. And he's good and he's righteous. And if he chooses to do so, praise the Lord. Hey, I'd be absent from the bodies, be present with the Lord. Anyhow, I'd love to be with the Lord. So, all of us are replaceable. I believe John felt very territorially threatened, and perhaps that this person was uh, stepping, or those were stepping on his toes, so to speak, although they were not. That was his perception. Unfortunately, we have to be careful of the matter of perception, because perception becomes reality in the eyes of the beholder, does it not? Even though it may not be reality, it can become reality to that person person. To John, he felt territorially threatened. He felt like his turf was invaded. Not a good thing. Now, perhaps this person, or perhaps he felt like, again, that this one was stepping on his toes, and kind of the attitude, well, who do they think they are coming around here? Coming around here and, and you know, doing these things in the name of, of the Lord, you know. Jealousy can easily develop when we look to others instead of looking to what God wants us to do. See, again, this goes back to verses 46 through 48, and they're still not really getting it, you know. Hey, I'm kind of stubborn like that too. It just, it just takes, you know, <laughs> many slappings in my life before it's like, oh, okay, all right, you know, I, I, I got it. And unfortunately, these guys were, were no different than that. So, uh, again, we see here that jealousy can easily develop. The apostles didn't have a corner on the market, so to speak. They didn't have a corner on the market of serving God or on the things that God had called them to do. You know, I, we had said yesterday, I don't remember exactly what was discussed at the moment, but I remember saying that, hey, if we remain silent... What does Scripture say? Even the rocks will cry out, right? Even the rocks will cry out. Like, like God, I mean, think about how humbling a thought that really is, okay? God can use a rock if he wants to use a rock. And that really tells me something about how we really have to give all of those things over to the Lord. We don't have a corner on the market. The reality is that they needed a real heart check. Now, we get into these verses here in verse 51 through verse 62. And let's look over the first few verses here in 51 through 56. It says, Now it came to pass when the time had come for him to be received up, that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And uh, as they went, they entered a village of the Samaritans to prepare for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set for the journey to Jerusalem. There was this constant feud. We're going to get into the whys behind this, but between the Samaritans and, and the rest of the Jews, and, or the Jews, I should say. 
And in verse 54, it says, And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and to consume them just as Elijah did? But he turned and he rebuked them and said, You do not know what manner of spirit you are of, for the Son of Man, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Now when Jesus came the first time, he came in mercy and grace. He came in mercy and grace to a lost world. Mercy and grace to a world who didn't know him. Mercy and grace to a world who needed him. Mercy is not giving us what we deserve. And we deserve hell. When we deserve punishment, it's not giving us what we do deserve. Grace is giving us what we could never earn. Grace, is, grace gives. Christ came and he gave of his very self. For God so loved the world that he gave of his only begotten son. But when he returns, well, time's up, so to speak. When he returns, well, James and John... Let's look at this. James and John were two brothers who Jesus gave the nickname Sons of Thunder to. Sons of Thunder. They were at the Transfiguration. We read about that. They were at the Transfiguration where Elijah was present, Moses was present. But they were quick to the trigger, so to speak. They were very quick to the trigger. Power grabs and jealousy have no place in ministry. Power grabs and jealousy have no place in ministry. Only humility and a heart to serve the Lord. Only humility and a heart to serve the Lord. Now, verses 57 through 62, it says, Now it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone uh, said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. Oh, we always talk big, don't we? <laughs> oh, I'm going to follow you wherever you, wherever you go, Lord, or... or Remember when Peter said to, uh, to the Lord, I'll never leave you, I'll never leave you. And, and don't get me wrong, I mean, I, I think sometimes you can easily, easily criticize Peter, but hey, I wasn't in Peter's shoes, right? It's so easy to be a Monday morning, you know, uh, uh, football or quarterback or commentator or whatever and, and say, well, this should have been done this way, that way, whatever. But the reality is, is I'd find myself probably doing exactly, uh, sinning in the same way that Peter did or conducting myself in the same way that Thomas, that he got the, the little nickname Doubting Thomas. I, I would have been just like these guys. Reality, why should I think any different of myself? I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And he said, Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. And then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said in verse 62, But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Pretty strong words there. Pretty strong words. Looking back. Now when Jesus, or actually I should say that, that people today, people today also make very bold statements. And usually they're oftentimes followed by excuses or inaction. The whole point in these verses is that physical matters, physical matters can't compare to spiritual ones such as the urgency, let's think about this, of the proclamation of the kingdom of God. Jesus is not saying, don't love your father. Jesus is not saying that the death, or actually we should more correctly say the eventual death of your father is not something that is important. What Jesus is saying is that God 
always must come first in one's life. I know growing up and even in much of my Christian walk, I've heard the, the, the statement, family first. It's not supposed to be that way. Christ said, if you love you know, mother or father or you know, son or daughter, whatever, more than me, you're not worthy of me. Why? He didn't say don't love them. He said you don't love them more than me. You see, how can I even give out or give back to my family vertically until I've been right horizontally? Or vert- no, how can I give back to my, my family uh, horizontally if I haven't been right vertically with the Lord? What do I have to give? What do I have to give that's really of any value? First, God. And then second, family? No. First, God. And then second, God. And third, you see what I'm saying? And when we are giving our all in our walk to the Lord, God gives us back what we need to raise our family and for a healthy marriage. But it's all one-on-one with the Lord. Physical matters cannot compare to the urgency of spiritual matters in proclaiming the kingdom of God. This man's father hadn't died. Man's father hadn't died here. The man wanted to wait until his dad passed. Well, who on earth knows when that's going to happen? My great grandma Corba was told, I believe this was in her 60s, that she had cancer and she was going to die of cancer. Now, this is a long, long time ago, very long time ago. And that she was going to die of cancer. She lived until her mid 90s. See, we don't know. We really don't know when such things are going to happen. So he's saying, hey, I'm going to hang out with my dad. I just want to wait until, you know, I bury my dad, and then I'm going to serve you. But there's always an excuse, isn't there? I need to lie, lay the tile in my house. Hey, I need to, to paint the house. Well, I need to work some overtime to get some more money so I can do this or achieve that. There's always a reason, so to speak, but not a true reason, why we don't really serve God. Endless excuses, but excuses don't change the world. Excuses don't change the world. And so that's the reality of the situation. And possibly he didn't even want to wait, uh, miss out on an inheritance. Maybe he was concerned, hey, if I leave and go now, then I'm not going to get that inheritance. Well, God wouldn't want me to miss out on that inheritance. Says who? Says who? You think God is concerned with such physical matters as that? Not at all. Not at all. God's concerned about people. People matter. God's concerned about you. God's concerned about the lost. God's concerned about those that know the Lord, those that don't know the Lord, that they come to the Lord, those that do know the Lord, that we grow in the Lord, and we proclaim the name of the Lord and the kingdom of God. Jesus is saying that the spiritually dead can bury the physically dead. Don't worry about it, man. I've got a plan and a purpose for your life. Now, with the man in verse 61... And another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first. You see, how do you say this? I will follow you. Think about it. I never even recognized this before. I will follow you, but. I will will pay my taxes, but. Okay, I'll drive the speed limit normally, but. I'm running late for work. How how do you say that? Mom and dad, I'm going to do exactly what you said, but, and I say, and think about this with God, if it doesn't work with people, okay? Hey, right, marriage, you come up here, you know, the, the, the music's playing, dun, 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 you know, and she comes up here and, and everything, I'm for better or for worse, right? But, for richer or for poorer, but, sickness and health, but, Hey, you're great as long as you don't lose your hair, don't lose your teeth, don't lose your, you know, um, whatever. But, and you get the point. That doesn't work with God. You see, he's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. Because by very definition of him being Lord, that means you don't call the shots anymore. I don't call the shots anymore. He's Lord. Are you with me? He's Lord. Okay, there's no I will but. It's yes, Father. Yes, Lord. Yes, sir. Can you imagine that? Those of you that went through basic training. 
<laughs> give, me, give me 100. I will, but. Oh, <laughs> guess what? It's 500 now, okay? It doesn't work, guys. Come on. Let's be real. So, and another said, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. So with the man here that we're reading about uh, in verse 61, um, uh, it was more than just a simple saying goodbye. And you know, we have to understand cultural things, okay? Here, it was more than just saying a simple uh, goodbye. What he wanted to do was go home, set his affairs in order, kind of get everything together, you know, maybe put the house up for sale, make sure that, you know, the taxes were filed, do this, do that, whatever it is, set his affairs in order, and then at some point, follow the Lord, you see? That's, again, the excuses. And unfortunately today, in another regard, some have, have um, you know, various interests in, in some area of ministry, perhaps. But they want it convenient. Ministry is not convenient. I've known the Lord for 33 years. I've been serving him for almost all of that time. It has never, ever been convenient to serve. It has not been convenient to pray. You, get, you can pretty much guarantee you start to pray, read, your, read the Bible, and you get a knock on the door, the dogs, you know, acting weird, the phone call, you know, come in, and, you know, kind of like the whole uh, uh, Calgon commercial, right? Remember those commercials growing up? Everything just kind of starts going haywire, right? It's never convenient to serve the Lord, but man, is it amazing. Man, is it amazing in serving the Lord and being about our Father's business, being about God's plan for our lives, seeing something, someone, the Lord, who is greater, something that's greater than ourselves. Man, it's a wonderful pursuit. It's a pursuit of love. It's not convenient. Or, or perhaps there are those interested in getting involved, serving in ministry, serving the Lord, but with minimal sacrifice. That's not how ministry works. It's not how ministry works. Wait, they say, I need, I need some sleep. I need this family thing that I need to do, or my house needs some work, or it's been a long day at the office, or whatever it may be. But as Christians, we're not to look, we're, we're called rather to look forward. We're not called to look back. Now look at this again here in verse 62. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Now it's evident from, uh, from the verse right here uh, in Jesus' time, that the plow usually uh, uh, had uh, but one handle, okay? Different than our, our you know, instruments of things that we use today. One hand would guide the plow, all right? While the other hand held the long uh, goad, a long staff uh, uh, pointed on the end, by which the oxen were spurred on to do their work. Now, since the plow was fairly lightweight, it was necessary for the, the plowman, so to speak, to lean himself forward with all his weight onto the handle um, uh, to keep the share, the cutting blade, uh, in the ground. Okay, so it was actually, you know, doing what it needed to do. Many commentators suggest that by looking back, the laborer would be unable to make straight furrows uh, in the ground there. And the usual method would be for the plowman to pick an object at the far end of the field. And you just pick that object at the far end of the field, and you keep your eyes right on it, and you're leaning forward like this, and you go, at, you go for it, you see? That's the thing. You're not leaning back. You can't do the work leaning back. You can't follow the path looking back, okay? Because where you look is there, there you go. Wherever you look, there you go, right? Guys, you start looking after some women, I'm looking after them lustfully, or women after guys lustfully. Look, it's the look that leads to the touch. It's the, it's the look, it's what goes on here that leads to that next uh, bit of action. Where you look is where you go. As you drive, where you look is where eventually you're going to veer to. So when we keep our eyes, as Scripture says, fixed on Jesus, right? Fixed on Jesus. He's the point that we look towards. You keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our what? Of our faith. That's what we're called to do. 
That's what each of us are called to do. So in chapter 10, let's look here at verse 1. It says, After these things the Lord appointed 70 others uh, also and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. It's interesting that in Genesis 10, we see uh, the nations that descended from Noah. You don't even turn there. But the nations that descended from Noah, 70 nations that are there. Um, now, this is a conjecture on my part, okay, uh, what I'm about to say. Um, but it's possible that the Lord chose 70 uh, ambassadors, okay, uh, basically is what they were, so to speak, as a way of saying or as a mes message of saying, basically, um, you know what? The message is ultimately going to go out into all the world, to all the nations, to all the nations. Nonetheless, let's look further here in verses 2 and 3. It says, Then he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Go your way. And you know, it's, it's interesting how many times, uh, for those that serve in the body of Christ, you've got to be careful of bitterness. It's very easy when you serve the Lord. You're consistent in serving the Lord uh, uh, in your life, in your family, uh, in ministry, to get bitter towards those that aren't serving the Lord. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about what those do or those don't do. We do, and we pray that God sends others to come and join us in this harvest the Lord uh, of the harvest, to send out laborers into his harvest. Go your way. Behold, I send you out as lambs among wolves. Isn't that encouraging? I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves, man. You guys are going to get creamed out there. <laughs> Not, you, you, think about this. Think about this. So is oftentimes missionary work. Missionary work. Well, I, I, I haven't gone on a mission, or okay, well, maybe one day you will. But you know what? You got missionary work in your own extended family. We all have in-laws and outlaws, and, uh, you know, and we all have extended family that doesn't know the Lord. You know what? I'll tell you what. For me personally, I, mean, I can tell just about anybody about Jesus. I'm at the gas station uh, some months ago there, and, and this guy hands me a medical marijuana card. It was later at night. He's like, and I, I, I'll be honest with you, I think I looked like a punk that night because, you know, I have on my baseball cap and I had it on backwards and I got a t-shirt on and jeans and my, my Converse and I'm just, I, I, I look like a punk. I'd been working around the house all day and I needed to get gas in my car and, and, and the guy's thinking, oh, he looks like someone that, you know, needs some dope, you know. I'm like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I really am like thinking to myself like, man, I guess I'm looking pretty shabby here, you know. And this guy, you know, he, Hey, here's a medical, here's a marijuana card. And, you know, and you say, yeah, we've got this place, man, and, you know, you can get all kinds of good stuff there and everything. And, and I said, man, I don't need that. Well, let, me, let me tell you about it. Let me tell you what, you know, what I'm on. And I started sharing with them about Jesus and all this kind of stuff. I, I can tell anybody anywhere about the Lord. But, man, you get around, like, extended family members, and, ooh, it gets pretty... Ooh, it gets really hot sometimes, you know, when you're dealing with family. I don't know, I'm just speaking, you know, for myself here. But, uh, uh, but nonetheless, <laughs> even then, there with Jesus, the ministry needs were great. Right then, Jesus is there, and he's saying, the harvest is plentiful. I just need more to go out and do the work. Not just that the people out there are plentiful. We know that the people are plentiful. He's saying there are people that are ripe for the picking. They're ready. They're ready. It's what we would call maybe the low-hanging fruit, Right? They're ready. They're there. Are you going to do something about it? Do you have a burden for the lost? Do you have a burden to tell people about Jesus Christ? I'm glad. I'm glad that there are those that had a burden that just those little seeds would be planted in my life when I was a teenager. I turned the station on TV. Billy Graham's having a crusade. I'd have my friend from down the street, little Ricky, come over. We'd play basketball. He tells me that Jesus is coming back. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? You know, these little seeds and these things. I'm thankful that there were those that were proclaiming the message, that were telling me about the Lord. Seeds are being planted, and eventually God watered it and brought the increase in my life. What about others that we can minister to? What about others? 
Now, I wouldn't say that this is, uh, uh, again, a good recruitment uh, tactic to say, hey, you're, you know, you're going to be like lambs surrounded by wolves. But, uh, but, but nonetheless, the, pl- the purpose was to demonstrate, the purpose was to demonstrate there that ultimately ministry is a full contact sport. <laughs> ministry is active warfare. It's warfare, guys. Scripture says that. We read this throughout the New Testament, that we need to be ready for war. Guess what? As soon as you come to Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord, you're at war. Whether you realize it or not, but I'll tell you who does know it very well, the adversary knows it. The adversary knows it. And he wants to break up your family. He wants to break up your marriage because God brought about the family. So the enemy wants to tear it down. God brought about marriage and the marriage covenant. The enemy wants to bring it down. God brought you to the Lord. The, Lord, the enemy wants to tear you down. And the enemy is seeking you out. You come to Christ, you have a giant bullseye on your back. You start serving in ministry. That bullseye just went from, from whatever it was to even larger. You see? Know it and expect it. God's word says it. You see? And we've got to be ready. The enemy is prowling around seeking whom he may devour. So, nonetheless, nonetheless, Jesus said the harvest is truly great. My friends, look around. Look around at family, neighbors, co-workers, wherever you find yourself, man. And notice that, that there are so many, so many that don't know the Lord, and maybe out of so many of those people, they're just ripe for the picking. And hey, God wants to use me, or God wants to use you, but if I remain silent, God will use someone else. But I I lose out on that blessing. I lose out on that blessing of seeing someone come to the Lord. I lose out on that blessing when I don't pray for someone in need. I I think, I I try my best. I don't always succeed, but I I try my best. Someone's got something going on. I don't want to say, hey, I'll pray for you, because guess what? I'm going to go home. I'm going to eat dinner, and I'm going to forget to pray for you half of the time. Let's be honest, okay? Life happens. It's like, hey, you've got a need. Hey, let's pray right now. Let's pray right now. I'll tell you what, it just, it, it's so encouraging. They need that encouragement. We need that encouragement to be there for one another. But again, the harvest truly is great. We look around, and we see that it is obviously the case. We need to pray for the harvesters. We need to pray that God sends more. We can be those harvesters. Proverbs 11.30 <clears throat> says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Now, who doesn't want to be wise? We don't wake up in the morning and say, Hey, I want to be a, you know, a numbskull. You know? hey, that's how I want to live my life. I'm gonna, you know? No, it's like you know, we want to be wise. As believers, as Christians, we want to be wise and start winning souls. How do I start winning souls? Start getting in the Word, man. Start telling them about what Jesus has done in your life. How you've been saved and redeemed. That was me. This is now. It's all because of Jesus Christ. Put your faith and your trust in Him. Start leading people to Christ. Daniel 12, 3 says, Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And those who turn many to righteousness. In other words, they weren't righteous. That righteousness is found only in Christ. Now, those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Or how about James chapter 5, verses 19 through 20? Brethren, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his way will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, hey, when I go to bed at night, And I've had the privilege to do that in someone's life. That's an awesome day. That's an awesome day. You know, I might not be feeling good that day. I might have car problems. I might have this issue, that issue, whatever going on. But you know what, though? I make a difference in someone's life. Or when we, when you make a difference in someone's life for the kingdom of God, it's the most amazing thing to experience. You're just on such a spiritual high. It's like, yeah, this is awesome. I'm doing something of real value in this world. And God, who sees everything, who sees all, God will reward. 
God will reward. You know, we drive by on the freeway here and we see, the, see those signs, you know, Palace Station, Station Casinos, whatever, five times points, blah, 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 and, you know, your rewards cards and everything. Ah, come on, it's baloney. No, real rewards are with God. They're not found at casinos that are, you know, hundreds and, you know, billions of dollars. Real rewards are found with the Lord. The Lord rewards, man. The Lord rewards. I want to be a heavenly investor. I want to invest in the kingdom of God. I want to invest in his kingdom. That's where the difference is. So verses 4 uh, through 12. It says, carry neither uh, money bag, knapsack, nor sandals, and greet no one uh, along the road. But whatever house you enter, first say, peace to this house. And if a son of peace is there, your peace will rest on it, and if not, it will return to you. And remain in the same house, eating and drinking such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not go from house to house. Just a side note, the times I've been to Thailand, and uh, you know, we were told, okay, whatever they give you, they're giving you the best of what they have, so eat it, just kind of like, <laughs> don't look, don't ask questions, you know, hear no, see no, whatever, and because you don't want to offend them, and, and I don't know sometimes what, what we were consuming, but you know, we didn't want to offend, so that it just opens up more opportunity for the gospel to be able to minister to these people. But anyhow, remain in that house, eating and drinking such things as they give. The laborer is worthy of his wages and do not go from house to house. Whatever city you enter and they receive you, eat such things as set before you and heal the sick there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near you. But whatever city you enter <clears throat> and they do not receive you, go out into the streets and say, the very dust of your city which clings to us, we wipe off against you. And that was you know, it's like an insult, really. Uh, nonetheless, know this, that the kingdom of God has come near you. But I say, verse 12, I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day for Sodom than for that city. Oh, you know, I mean, how many times have we heard of, we uh, speak of you know, Sodom or Sodom and Gomorrah, right? I mean, just, just a place of, of, of great sin of great uh, rebellion and offense to God. You catch up on that whole uh, account in the book of Genesis. There was an urgency to get moving without delay or without distraction. That's why he's saying, you know what, don't worry about taking the, 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 the coat and, and, and bringing, you know, your little goodie bag with you and this and that, everything else. I want to provide for you along the way. And you know, that's the cool thing about ministry is that God, where God guides, God provides. I don't, I don't understand how God does what he does. And, and I'm, a, I'm a pretty black and white kind of guy, sometimes to a, to a fault. I was telling one of my sons recently, who's, who's just like me in this, very, very black and white. I told him, yes, we are very black and white, but we live in a colored world. So we have to recognize that sometimes, you know, everything isn't quite as we seem to, to see it. But... Uh, um, but nonetheless, I, I don't understand how God does what he does, but I don't need to understand. I just need to walk by faith, right? Isn't that all that we need to do? It's just walk by faith and just trust the Lord. And so we do so, and God provides along, uh, along the way. People are dying and are going to spend eternity in hell without uh, true faith in Jesus Christ, which is evidence in their lives. Yes, there has to be an evidence. We can't subtract the evidence from, from true faith. Well, I have faith in God, really? And show me. Not me, but I mean, show that, that, that faith in God has very real action. I can't say I have faith in God and there's no action and biblical change in my life. I'm lying to myself. You see? There must be biblical change that begins to take place and growth that takes place. And, and people are going to hell. People are going to hell right here in this town. There are hundreds of churches in Las Vegas. I heard there's 600. I don't know if that's the exact approximate number or not, but there are hundreds of churches in Las Vegas. Not a whole lot of them, my friends, that teach the Word of God. I'll be honest with you. It's real sad. Not a lot that teach the Word of God. But there are those that do teach the Word of God and praise the Lord, you know, for that. But hundreds of churches in Las Vegas, and yet in 33 years, I've never had a Christian come to my door and give me the gospel. Never. Never. 
I'm waiting to, to get back from uh, a trip that I've got to take here, and then uh, within a week or two uh, after that, I just have to look at the calendar so that there's not a, a conflict in schedule. I was talking to the men yesterday morning about this, and uh, starting here in, in November, um, we're going to start going door to door. We're going to start going door to door. We've got to do it. We've got to go out there. Hey, we can hang a sign all day long and say, hey, church, you know, blinking lights, Las Vegas, neon, church, come here. But, but really, the reality is we need to go to them. That's what we need to do. That's what we do in, in a number of different areas that we serve in uh, uh, in the ministry here. But now we need to start going to the door. We need to go to people's doors and tell them, give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. 33 years, never had anyone come to my door, tell me about, tell me about the Lord. You know? I want you to think about this. In the United States, every day, approximately 6,800 people die. Every day in the United States, it equals about uh, almost 2.5 million people a year die in the United States. And I'm telling you, most of those people do not have their faith in Jesus Christ. We have work to do. There's work to be done. And I can't go to bed at night and just think, oh, I got this nice comfy bed, and I know, hey, to live is Christ, to die is gain, so hey, it's great, and I'm going to be with the Lord. Yeah, what about that person next door to me? That ain't okay. That ain't okay. Now, I can't, I can't control or change, you know, they have their choice, before God, okay, but man, I've got, I've got to let them know. I've got to give them the gospel. We've got to give them the gospel. It can't be okay to see that their proverbial house is on fire and we're just going to let them burn down. It's not okay. God's church has to rise up and take action. You see, this is important. So judgment is coming to a Christ-rejecting world. That's reality. Eventually, time is up, guys, you know? Judgment is coming to a Christ-rejecting world. It's a very real consequence of that rejection. You know, if God, if God didn't spare Sodom and Gomorrah, then he's not going to spare anyone else who rejects him because of their own sin or desires for self. By the way, the biblical account of Sodom and Gomorrah um, <laughs> are not fables. They're very real account of what God did there in that location at that time. Archaeology and science validates this, validates it. Whether it validated it or not, it doesn't matter because I know that God's word is true. But nonetheless, archaeology and science validate uh, uh, this whole thing. There's a, there's a biblical warning. The Lord in Genesis 19, 24, you don't need to turn there. The Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, well, that's ridiculous. Oh, yeah. He rained brimstone and fire. Oh, I do have it on the screen. Uh, uh, on Sodom and Gomorrah uh, from the Lord out of uh, the heavens. Second Peter 2, 6 says, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Okay, so we see what he rained down there. You see, we see what he did to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. He turned them to ashes, condemning them to destruction, making them an example for those who afterward would live ungodly. Now, the five cities of the plain uh, that are there have been located, and the evidence is absolutely staggering. Uh, for the first time in modern history, we have found uh, round balls of brimstone, interestingly enough, and uh, nearly pure silver, uh, embedded uh, in the ashen area near the Dead Sea. Now, uh, the next right here, you're going to see a, a photo as best as you can um, of this uh, uh, ziggurat standing amidst the ashen ruins in Gomorrah with the darker terrain. It's hard to tell here. It comes out great on my computer, but it doesn't come out so great here. With the darker terrain uh, in the rear. And I could pull up so many photos for you, some of the, uh, the Google uh, map kind of photos uh, that are way up. And man, you can just see just like, like a white ashen ruins uh, in these areas. And then the rest of the areas would be what we would consider uh, normal. Analysis of the, of the brimstone. Uh, these, sulfur, these sulfur balls are mostly, for the most part, golf-sized kind of balls. Some have burn marks uh, around them. Um, if you look right here at this one here, um, this is a, a brimstone with a burned, uh, if you can see that there a little bit, a uh, hardened shell that has an unburned sulfur inside. And next to it is brimstone. The next photo, I should say, right there is, uh, is a photo of brimstone without a burned shell. The photo... Um, 
The sulfur is inside of that, okay? Tiny crystals are on the surface, which you can see right there, which were formed when the sulfur was burning and was in a liquid state, uh, and, then it, and then it would burn out. But, uh, uh, I mean, these are the things that we found. I mean, there's so much of this stuff, it's, it's like all over the place. Uh, each of the cities on the plain contained evidence. I want you to think about this. This is amazing. Each of the cities on the plain contained evidence of brimstone, which God rained down upon the cities to destroy them. Each of the cities there, Sodom and Gomorrah too. The brimstone is, compared, is composed of approximately 96 to 98 sul percent uh, uh, sulfur with trace amounts of magnesium, which is important, um, which creates an extremely high temperature for burning. This is the only place on earth, the only place on earth where you can find 96% pure monoclinic sulfur in a round ball. Only place on earth. And when you read what God said in his word, man, I mean, God, God's word is true, amen? It's true. It's true. So guess what that means? That means also when God says that he loves you, guess what? Stop listening to those lies. God can't love me. God doesn't love me. Liar. God loves you. If God says he loves you, he loves you. If he says he's got a plan and purpose for your life, he's got a plan and purpose for your life. If he says that you can be saved, guess what? You can be saved. It's the word of God. The proof and the evidence is there. You don't see that on CNN. When was the last time you went on? I mean, this is amazing news. When was the last time you turned on MSN? You found that. You don't see it. Okay? The only place on earth where you can find 96% uh, uh, of this kind right there and round ball. The brimstone is not from any type of geothermal activity, by the way, and there is no evidence of uh, geothermal activity in the area. Geothermal, by the way, sulfur nodules are only 40% pure sulfur anyhow. So even if there was, it still wouldn't have that same kind of composition. The next photo that we got right here, holding a chunk of, uh, of ash, there's a chunk of ash right there that has a burning ring, which surrounds an unburned ball of uh, sulfur kind of in the center there. You can, uh, you can see that. Next picture, a little bit better, is brimstone with a burn ring. Okay, so you see that as well. The next photo, this one's uh, rather interesting to me. Um, this photo, the extremely high burning temperature, uh, temperatures created uh, a multi-shaded, and you can see it, hopefully you can see all of these interesting kind of like uh, wiggles or, or whatever. Um, it's really interesting there on the side of that. Th so these extremely high burning uh, temperatures created a multi-shaded layering of ash that was formed by uh, thermal ionization caused by electrons repelling and attracting, creating a swirling effect uh, in the remains. Again, caused by those extremely burning high temperatures. Well, we already read what Scripture said, that what God was going to do. God says he's going to do something. He does it. He does it. When Jesus said that he's coming back, guess what that means? He's coming back. Man, you guys are like so, you know. He's coming back. He's coming back. All right, nothing. Am I ready? Man, I got to be ready for the return of the Lord, man. Are you ready? Well, I'm going to wait a little longer and, you know, and this and that and, you know. Teach me to number my days, Scripture says. I don't know that I've got tomorrow or tonight. I could leave this place and, and, you know, lose my life. Come on. Come on. It's time to get right with the Lord. This last picture that I want to show you, next one, it's a really good one. Uh, it shows it really, really well. I wish I had more that were like that one. Um, but you get the point, okay? And I just thought when I'm putting this together, I thought, man, we need to see this stuff. We need to see this stuff. Uh, some of you may have seen some of this. Uh, I would venture to say probably the majority in this room have not, okay? And I see things like that, and it's like, man, that's just a faith. That, that's, that's an encouragement. It's a faith builder. Uh, so we see very uh, clearly, very clearly, uh, when God says, I say to you that it will be more tolerable in that day, verse 12, in that day for Sodom than for that city. What city? The city, the town, the people reject the Lord. You see? So then in verses 13, we're going to close this out here in just a couple of minutes. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, 
They would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, but it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon, and Sidon at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. He who hears, you hears me. And he who rejects you rejects me. And he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. Look, ultimately, rejection is not... You know, I think sometimes we don't say anything because we don't want to deal with rejection, right? It doesn't matter what people think about you. Stop think, wondering and caring about what people think about you and let's, uh, about me or about us. We need to be more concerned about what people think about Jesus, man. What people think about Jesus. He's Lord. I'm not, Okay? I'm just flesh, and this flesh is going to die unless the rapture happens before then. This flesh is corrupting. This flesh is falling apart. Like, really, actually, lately, <laughs> it's really falling apart, you know? And, and I mean, but hey, my trust is not in this flesh, and my trust isn't in what somebody thinks of me. My trust is in the Lord, and the only thing I care about is what people think about Jesus. That, that's what's important. That doesn't mean that I have a no-care attitude and I can act however I want to act, and it's like, oh, well, you know. That, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm saying, don't let fear stop you from telling people about the Lord. Instead, use fear. Use fear in your life to propel you. Use fear to propel you to greater things in the kingdom of God, to be used for him, to be used for his glory. So again, it just reminds me of a statement. If God, you know, and I think Billy Graham had said this, I don't know, but if God doesn't judge America for her sins, then I have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. So think about this. We live in America. 6,800 people die every day. 2.5 million die every year. And judgment is coming. Why are you talking about judgment? I want, I want to talk about happy things in church. Okay, well... Judgment is a happy thing, too. There's another kind of judgment. There's a judgment of the unrighteous, and then there's the judgment of the righteous. The judgment of the righteous is unto rewards. The judgment of the unrighteous is unto condemnation. So, hey, I'm all for God's judgment. It's a judgment. God's judgment for those of us who are in Christ is a judgment for rewards, man. This is the awesome stuff. I have nothing to fear before him. You see? It's just all good from the Lord. It's all good from him. So you know what? We will talk about the judgment, and we will talk about heaven, and we will talk about hell. Jesus talked about hell more than he talked about heaven. Maybe we should too. Maybe more people would realize, hey, I'm going there. I better, you know, I need to put my faith in the Lord to save myself from there. So today, I pray that, that the word here in chapter, in chapter 9 and in chapter 10, or part of chapter 10, I hope encourages us to have a burden for the lost, to have a burden for the lost, for our families, for our neighbors, for our coworkers, for when those of us, and, and we're going to have the sign-up sheet here, out here in a couple of weeks, because we're in a week or two, uh, it might be next week, um, to start getting involved with the door-to-door ministry. And I'd love to have you come along with us Love to have you come along with us. We're going to go in teams. It's going to be exciting, and I want to see what God does uh, in growing us uh, in the process. But uh, with that, let's just uh, close in prayer. Oh, bless the Lord, all my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Lord, we bless your holy name. We praise you. We thank you, Lord, and we give you glory because there's no God like our God. There's no Lord like our Lord. Lord, I thank you that you have brought me into the faith, that you've opened my eyes, that you've brought me from darkness to light, from lost to now I'm found. That you've changed my life, not from the outside in. That's man's way. Man never reaches God man's way. Man can't reach God. That's the reason why God came down to man. Because man could not reach God. You came down to us, Lord. You came down to earth. You came from heaven and earth, like we sing, to show us the way. Praise God. Praise God. You have such a love for us, Lord. And in the midst of our sins, 
you where it says that Christ died for the ungodly. That was me. That was us. But maybe you're here today. Maybe you're here this morning, and you haven't put your faith in this Jesus. Man. Scripture says that today is the day of salvation. Don't wait another day. Don't wait another moment to have peace with God. Don't wait another moment to have forgiveness of sins. Don't wait another moment to have a clearing of all of those things. Don't wait another moment to get right with God because you might not have another moment. Today is the day of salvation. Right here, right now. And if you would like to put your faith in Jesus Christ, then would you just agree along with me in prayer today? Lord Jesus, just pray from, pray from your heart. Pray out loud, Lord Jesus, I put my faith in you today. I ask you to come into my life and make me new. I believe that you are God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sins because I couldn't pay for my sins. I believe that you rose from the grave. I believe that you love me. And Lord, I give my heart, my life to you. Come into my life now and make me new. And Lord, for all the rest of us in here, those that made that decision at some point in the past, Lord, Lord, I pray in these last days, may we be challenged to end well. May we be challenged to run the race with endurance, as it says in your word, to fight the good fight of faith, to not give up, to not wallow in depression, but to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, Allow ourselves to be filled with your Holy Spirit to be used by you, proclaiming, proclaiming, even as we said in communion, the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, we proclaim, we proclaim the name that is above every name. Lord, we just pray this morning for those that are here that are struggling in some area, Lord God, just struggling with, with just life, and the difficulties and hardships and all of those things. Oh, Lord, we pray right now, may your Holy Spirit just minister to them in just such a wonderful and amazing way. May we just bask in your presence and rest in your love and trust in your word. Lord, we praise you and we thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name and all God's church said, amen and amen. It says in 2 Thessalonians, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Amen.